Good morning, KPC. Welcome to the house of the Lord. We're so glad to worship with you this morning. Before we um, get started with our call to worship, the author of this hymn we're going to sing, I love this quote that she said, Fanny Crosby said, it is not my ability, but my response to God's ability that counts. And so this morning, we're going to sing to God be the glory. And I just want to encourage you that we give him all the praise and glory for the things that he's done in our lives and in our families and our community. I'm going to say that one more time. It is not my ability, but my response to God's ability that counts. Welcome to KPC. We're so glad you're here. I'm going to pray for us, Skylar. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for being here with us, that this is your sanctuary and that you are in us. Father, I pray that this morning our hearts would be glad for what you have done and what you are doing in us and around us. Father, I pray that your peace would fall, your comfort comfort would fall and that we couldn't help but burst and rejoice in you. Amen. We're going to make a good exchange this morning. We're going to take our sorrows and trade them for the joy of the Lord. We're going to take our shame and we're going to trade them for the joy of the Lord. We're going to take our burdens, our sickness, our pain, and we're going to trade them for the joy of the Lord. How about that? I'm 
play a second because I just have this, this feeling in my heart the most important powerful thing that we can do is say yes to the Lord give the Lord your yes this morning because guess what this gift this trade that he wants to give you of his joy and his his burden his yoke that's light and easy it's free all you have to do is say yes that's all you have to do is say yes Lord I'm trading the muck and the mire of humanity for the grace and goodness of Jesus Christ. So let's sing this, I'm trading and give the Lord our yes one more time in this place today. I'm trading my sorrows. I'm trading my sin. Yes, Lord. 
sing your love, Lord Jesus.
Pete, do you want to share a little bit of what you got this morning? Maybe just give us, give us, I can mention it if you want. Yeah, come on. Probably best, best that it's not prepared, so uh, uh, I've just been praying about this church. I love you guys. I love coming to KPC. Me and my wife have been here about 15 years, and uh, yeah, I was really touched by uh, Pastor Benjamin's words last week, and um, just praying for the church, and the Lord was really showing me the church of Antioch in Acts. Um, if you go online, there's like different models of the Church of Antioch, but that's not really what he was showing me. He was showing me that <clears throat> the Church of Antioch, they believed in God, they were filled with the Spirit, they needed help and they got it from outside. The church in Jerusalem sent Barnabas, and then when Barnabas got there, he saw that it was a church, a mixed group of believers from all over the place. And so he said, hey, I know somebody I know somebody who's got that calling. And he brought Saul, who became Paul, he brought him in. And Barnabas and Saul taught there and equipped that church. And then that church began sending, sending people out to the entire world. And I just, I feel that KPC has that, that calling to start equipping believers and sending. And it starts right here with what we're doing. Worshiping God in the spirit and then being equipped, and then sending. So I encourage you guys, keep praying for KPC. God hasn't forgotten us. As a matter of fact, he's calling us from a past glory into a greater glory. Amen. When, when he came to me and said Antioch, I got chills. And the sense I got was sending, and that's exactly what he got. He went online and he couldn't find anybody talking about sending when they talked about Antioch, but that's exactly where we were connecting. But it actually connects to the worship service too because I was thinking, oh no, ascending church is an obedient church. That means we're going to enter into a state of obeying the guidance of the Holy Spirit, which there's actually an elder's covenant in the prayer room where they all signed it and said, we will obey the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And if we don't have it, we will wait. And I read that and I was like, whoa, <laughs> this is awesome. Because you don't get to send who you choose. You get to send what the, who the Spirit cho chose, right? He said the Holy Spirit set Paul and Barnabas aside. You don't get to send the person on the periphery. You get to send whoever the Lord's putting his hand on to send. And that means obedience. And what was the, the emphasis in Olivia's heart? Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. What do we have to switch back to when we've been humbled? We're going to stop saying, bless, Lord. Bless what I'm doing. We're going to start saying, yes, Lord. What are you doing? What do you want to do with us? <clears throat> right? Amen. Amen. One of the things that the Lord's been speaking with me about, besides being ascending church, 
is that in our worship, I think we're going to find our worship changing a little bit in style. And I don't mean music or anything like that. Those of you who, like me, grew up, kind of came up in the charismatic renewal, remember the days of happy, happy. Yes, yes. You, you know the happy, happy. And lots of clapping and just, you know, happy, happy. And we carry that with us, and that's sort of what we look for. But God is saying he's going to be doing something a little differently. He's going to teach us how to worship in awe. In wonder. That's where he's going. That's where he's going with us. He's going to be starting something here, and it's going to start rippling out from here in this area as we rediscover the magnitude of our God and can only fall before him in awe and wonder. That's where he's going. Just be forewarned. There are a lot of other things happening. And we want to make you aware of them. Some announcements. I'm not sure, are we getting any announcements up? The uh, first one on my list, yes, okay, we're on, on, on the list now here. The Christian Education Scholarship Fund, <clears throat> which was going great guns back in March, got, along with our pictorial directory and everything else, slightly interrupted by this whole COVID thing. Okay, God knows what he's doing. But we do want to continue with the scholarship fund. We do, school is starting up. We have students who are going to need support. <coughs> so we're going to be actually taking the offering today, the special offering to benefit the KPC Christian Education Scholarship Program, um, please consider giving to help ensure that your fellow KPC members can gain an education based on the truth of God's Word in every subject, in history, science, literature, math, geography, economics, government, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And today is the deadline also for applications. If, if you or someone you know who needs to apply for a scholarship, today's the deadline. You've got to get it in today. It's good. They're going to be weighed and evaluated and picked through tomorrow, I think tomorrow. So it needs to be, needs to be in today. Um, when we get to the point of the offering, you'll notice we have baskets up front. We're not allowed, still not allowed to pass offering plates. So the usual offering hasn't been happening. Um, you can still give online, but for today, during the offertory, we will actually be receiving an offering. There's a basket on either side, and there's one behind the center spotlight upstairs in the balcony. So when you want to give your offering, if you've given it up front, that's fine. But if you want to give an offering here, you can bring your offering down front during the offertory. If you want to make an offering specifically for the scholarship fund, please note it on, on that. And you can come up and, and bring it so that we can ensure that some of our young people will have the financial resources they're needing to go forward in their education. Um, the... Uh, David, next thing, David's Tent. Uh, we are going to be hosting David's Tent here at KPC, and it's actually going to be in a tent out here by the, by the church. Uh, we're going to be working with Tent America 2020. It's 72 hours of continuous praise and worship. If you can't get your fill of it, if you don't have enough of it here on Sunday, come on back for the David's Tent, uh, Tent America event out here by the church. It's going to be starting August 29th at 9 p.m. 
and will be going for 72 hours, that's night and day, until 9 p.m. on September 1st. It's part of 100 days of praise, started out, I think, on the West Coast, and it's working its way like a wave across America. We're coming up to the end of it now, and we have, we're going to be hosting three days of it here. Um, if you want to be involved, you can either check on uh, worship at David's Tent, 757.com, or just speak to Olivia. She's, she's on the board here um, for David's Tent. Um, we need musicians, we need singers, we need artists, dancers, intercessors, other volunteers. Anything you can do, they'll plug you in someplace. And we want to just lift up the name of Jesus over this city. Grief Share is starting up again, but they're going to be doing it differently. They're going to be in having Zoom meetings this, for this quarter, starting Thursday, September 24th, be 7 to 8.30 p.m. for 14 weeks. Uh, it provides compassionate, faith-based, and pr very practical coping skills to those who are grieving the death of a loved one. Videos, group discussions, there's, uh, they have, and they, they share, they're very confidential, they respect each other's privacy, and just want to be there to support each other. These are people who have been through it, or who are going through it together, through loss. The number of participants is limited, so please let Kim Bond know um, that's uh, at the, you can call at the church, and that someone, a facilitator, will contact you, explain the program, answer your questions, uh, get you registered. Uh, case, KPC members and attendees have first priority, but it's not limited to that. You may know someone else. Get them in touch with us. Get them in touch with us. Um, first come, first served. We have limited, that's very important to say, we have a limited number of slots, first come, first served, so, so hurry up. Uh, the only cost is $15 to cover the cost of the workbook. There's a workbook to help you working through and help in the discussions, and there is that cost. That's the only cost. If you know someone who needs this and they can't afford that, let us know. There are monies available to cover even the cost of the workbook, if that will help. So get the word out about Grief Share. It's a very important ministry, and I'm so pleased that we can host it through KPC. Um, the next thing, officers. It is that time we need nominations. There are nomination uh, forms out in the narthex. You can pick one up. Uh, fill it out. May, if you nominate someone, please ask them first if it's okay. You know, the one thing I don't want is someone nominated because you want to get their, get, get their goat. Yeah, this will just, just make them horrible. No, no. Um, make sure that, they, that they're interested, that they want to, and uh, before you nominate them. Uh, we are going to need four deacons two elders, one trustee. Four deacons, two elders, one trustee. Um, deadline is going to be September thir Sunday, September 13th. So please get your thinking cap on. Above all, get your praying cap on. See what the Lord's saying and who you want to put forward. As uh, Please, by the way, use a different form for each nomination you want to make. If you have an idea for a trustee, use one form. If you have an idea for an elder, get another form and use that. Just Because if we have multiple on one form, that's going to get kind of confusing. Well, okay, to me it's going to be confusing, <laughs> right? So please, a, new, a fresh form for each nomination. Uh, congregational meeting. I know that's a lot we're going through, but this is important stuff. There will be a congregational meeting on August 30th. 
uh, immediately following the worship service for the purpose of dissolving the pastoral relationship between KPC and Pastor Neil Ellison, which would then be effective October 4th, 2020, in order to release him into a well-deserved retirement. That will be August 30th, congregational meeting. Please be, be sure to attend. We need a quorum so we can release him from his call, okay? So he can go with our blessing. There will also are, are being planned some various events and opportunities to, to wish him well, to, to see him, to greet him, to send him off. So he will not get away from us completely unscathed. He will be, he will be, he will probably be hugged until he's soft and mushy. Um, but we won't admit that because we are in the days of COVID. Just saying. A um, couple of other announcements that we didn't make it into the slides. One is the clothing closet that was going to be on Saturday got all set up and it got all rained out. Um, so as a result, it's been postponed for a week, but there, the things are gonna be, are there in the fellowship hall. If you wanna go through and look and find something you need, feel free to do it, go check it out. If you see something you need, you can take it with you. Otherwise, what's left? will be open to the public next Saturday, weather permitting. Um, another thing for which we don't have a slide, to my knowledge, today after the service at 12.30, we're having a memorial service to remember Ray Witter. So if you can, please make a point to come and join us and, and remember and Ray and share in that and, and rejoice in, in his wonderful witness and the life he had. Uh, everyone who knew him appreciated him. That'll be 1230 here in the sanctuary. One other thing that didn't even make it onto this list is that um, our tech specialist, Harrison Keller, has been offered a new position in Michigan he will need people interceding for him. It is close to Detroit. So lift him up in your prayers. Um, but he has been offered a position at Cornerstone Church uh, outside Detroit, and he has accepted that and will be leaving us in two weeks. Um, we will try to figure out some way to... to do a send-off for him as well, um, but do keep him and Bethany and little Jack in your prayers. I have told him, by, told, I have told him, we will not let him go until Bethany and Jack have been here, yeah. right? Yeah. You hear that clapping. Um, so, so we're going to make sure they get here, that we'll be able to pray for them and send them off properly. Do pray for, for the church and the session as we look for, to find, uh, I can't say a replacement, I think he's irreplaceable, but, but uh, maybe, maybe we can find a half dozen people that can, you know, kind of cover all the things he does with one hand. Um, so God has richly blessed us, and he, we're now also sending, we're sending people that are very dear to us, that we've really kind of come to rely on. That's what happens when you become a sending church. Don't you know how much Antioch relied on Paul and Barnabas? Paul especially, he was doing most of the teaching. Barnabas, who was a prophet. And yet, the Lord said, I want you to send these on the road. And the church said, with your blessing, Lord, and with ours. As we come before the Lord, he, uh, 
We come with, without empty hands. The Old Testament says, don't let someone come into the temple with empty hands. You don't come with empty hands. You come bringing something. At the very least, your heart and your skills and your time and your ability. And so, receiving an offering has become a part, regular part of Christian worship services ever since Paul, where we come and we bring our gifts and yield what we have to do his work and what he's calling us to do. So as we do, let's, uh, let's come before the Lord, let's pray and ask his blessing on this offering. Let's pray. We want our church to offer, Lord, programs for our youths, training for our children in everlasting truths, a preacher who inspires us and works for all it's worth, plus food and clothes and shelter for the needy round the earth. But Lord, you've set this principle, no matter what we pray for or how ambitious our designs, we get just what we pay for. We bring our gifts to you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Please come forward with your offerings.
I was just given a little note that there's not going to be a closed closet next Saturday. Um, so what's in there, take with you, <laughs> please, or else we'll have to take it and donate it to another charity. Uh, but today's, the, not right now, not right now, but today's the time to go look. I'd like to continue looking at the diary of Nehemiah. Today's sermon is Act of God. Act of God. <clears throat> this week, North Carolina had its strongest earthquake in over a hundred years. It measured 5.2 on the Richter scale at the epicenter in Sparta on the edge of the Appalachian Mountains near the Virginia line. Shook the ground all the way up to Charlottesville, Virginia, all the way down to North Georgia. My wife noticed our house vibrating. And she noticed the dogs were barking. They were puzzled. What is that? She called to tell me about it. And then she added, by the way, it used to cost only 10 or $12 a year. Maybe you should think about adding earthquake insurance to our homeowner's policy. <laughs> Not a bad idea when you live in an old brick house. It's called an act of God. It means any major catastrophe not covered by your insurance company. That is, unless you buy extra protection, you know, against hurricane or tornado, flood, firestorm, asteroids, zombie apocalypses, you laugh. Yes, they have it. They offer it. As far as I'm concerned, insurance against zombie apocalypses cannot be cheap enough. I think I might, just for the novelty of it, I might be willing to pay 37 cents a year. But if you want earthquake insurance, you have to pay extra. Or your homeowner's policy will not pay you one rent cent. As America, it's kind of ironic though, as America tries to purge God from our money, you know, that in God we trust, there are the others that want to get rid of that all the time. They want to get rid of the Pledge of Allegiance because it mentions God. To eliminate prayer from our schools and from our council meetings, remove the Ten Commandments from our courthouses. Does this mean then that acts of God will also be cut from our insurance policies so that all catastrophic claims will be automatically covered? I doubt it. Not whenever secular society can actually profit from appealing to God. In business and law, an act of God is always something bad, destructive, and catastrophic. It shows you what lawyers and businessmen think about God. That he's the mean person in the sky. He's the killjoy. He's the unpredictable destroyer. 
No wonder folks want to get rid of a God like that if that's all they know of him. I would, I, even I'd want to get rid of a God like that. It's not who I believe in. But when Nehemiah talks about an act of God, he means something good. Urban redevelopment. God style. B.C. God style. The kingdom of Judah was ravaged. Its capital, Jerusalem, destroyed by the armies of Babylon in 587 B.C. By 445, almost a century and a half, a century and a half after the war, the wounds are still raw. Jerusalem is still in ruins. And you wonder, how could they wait so long to rebuild? How could they wait so long to, to fix things, to fix this? You could only shake your head. I mean, just imagine, it's, it's as if America still had raw wounds 150 years after the Civil War. Oops. We do. Nehemiah, who was personal steward and bodyguard to the king of Persia, he hears about the sorry state of his ancestral home, and he's heartbroken over it. He's so moved by the city's plight because, you see, rebuilding the broken walls of Jerusalem and replacing its charred gates was always about more than just bricks and mortar. Imagine the emotional impact you might feel seeing nothing but vacant shopping malls and boarded up store windows in your own hometown. I remember what I felt in the pit of my stomach when I saw it in my hometown. You see, the condition of the walls and the gates had in the same way both practical but also symbolic and emotional significance. The walls of a city offered security. Broken walls meant that bandits and marauders, wolves and wild dogs could come and go by night, preying upon the residents at will. Without walls, you were defenseless. Gates meant you could monitor and control who entered, who left, and when. You could identify who belonged there inside the city, who was a citizen, and who enjoyed particular legal protections. Merchants and traders, you know, they avoided cities without defenses or police forces, without law, an order. Market stalls would be left empty. Storefronts would literally, even then, be boarded up. Walls and gates defined a city and they provided structure and identity. It meant restoring, therefore, order and governance, safety and peace, as well as civic pride and dignity to the people. They wanted to feel proud about, well, I'm from so-and-so. And everyone says, oh, that's such a beautiful city. And it's so well kept up and clean. And because it was the city of God, it also said something about the honor and dignity of God and how the people feel about this God of theirs. So Nehemiah 
is moved to get personally involved in its rebuilding. He prays. He forges a real action plan. He waits for God to open the doors, the right doors, at the right time. And when opportunity knocks, he takes the, he's scared, but he takes the opportunity and tells the king of Persia, the most powerful man in the world at that time, and soon finds himself with a detachment of troops on his way to his ancestral hometown. And Nehemiah kept a personal diary of his experiences and his efforts that revealed something about faith and commitment and leadership when a man of God is called to rebuild the fallen city of God. So how do you lead change in your community and church? How do you restore order, structure, and community pride? At this, for this stage, let's look at Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 9 through 20, if you turn there with me. Then I came, Nehemiah writes, then I came to the governors of the province beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. These were just letters of introduction. Now the king had sent officers of the army and cavalry with me. When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard this, it displeased them greatly that someone had come to seek the welfare of the people of Israel. So I came to Jerusalem and was there for three days, and then I got up during the night. I and a few men with me, I told no one what my God had put into my heart to do for Jerusalem. The only, only animal I took was the, the animal I rode. I went out by night, by the valley gate, past the dragon spring into the dung gate, and I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that had been broken down and its gates that had been destroyed by fire. And then I went on to the fountain gate and to the king's pool. But there was no place for the animal I was riding to continue. So I went up by the way of the valley by night and inspected the wall. And then I turned back and entered by the valley gate and so returned. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing. I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, and the rest that were to do the work. And then I said to them, you see the trouble that we're in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates burned. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem so that we may no longer suffer disgrace. And I told them that the hand of my God had been gracious upon me, and also the words that the king had spoken to me. And then they said, oh, let's start building. So they committed themselves to the common good. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official and Geshem the Arab heard of it, they mocked and ridiculed us, saying, what is this that you're doing? Are you rebelling against the king? And then I replied to them, the God of heaven is the one who will give us success, and we, his servants, are going to start building. But you have no share or claim or historic right in Jerusalem. May God bless to us this reading. This is, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now, so first... As he, gets, as he approaches, Nehemiah contacts those in authority. He visits the local governors and shows them the respect due their office. Protocol has its place. 
I know that's hard for charismatics to embrace because we want to be free and loose, you know. But no, structure is okay. And the, uh, when God allows certain people to be in authority, he has his reasons. And we respect that, if only the office. You see, that is our first defense against anarchy. If you want to create a healthy organization with structure and good order, you have to respect the order and the structure that already exist. Now, you may eventually be modifying or changing that, but you have to respect what's there before you can improve on it. On the other hand, and at the same time, some leaders in the city of God, in the church, will not always welcome revitalization and renewal. Now, that, here that may not be the case. Although there may be, maybe not formally recognized leaders, there are different kinds of leadership in the church, by the way. I didn't go into here in my manuscript, but just to mention, there are lots of different kinds of influence of which offices and official influence is only one. You always have the people that are kind of behind the scenes who know people and get on the phone and they know how to stir the pot or they know how to motivate people. That can be for good, that can be for bad. But you know what I, those are those unofficial challenges, uh, channels, excuse me, unofficial channels of influence and power. And they may be all for it, some of them may not. Because you see, it's so much simpler to maintain the status quo. Just do, you know, last year's programs over again and again and again. Anything different sounds like more work. Yeah, I just heard some chuckles there. You know what I'm talking about. What change does, that's fine. I don't mind change as I don't have, as if I don't have to do anything for it to happen, right? Change, when we say, let's do a new program, let's do it this way or change it over this way, then it's, oh, does that, oh man, that sounds like work. That sounds, I'm, I've already got so much on my plate. I don't know how I'd work it in. I don't know how I'd have the time or just the, the energy to do anything more. My schedule already has so many deadlines and appointments. And then there are some leaders in the church, official or unofficial, who, who <clears throat> don't want to do evangelism and grow the church because they don't really want to welcome news, you know, newcomers they don't know and who might not respect the way we've always done things. I remember Cece telling me about one woman whom she dearly loved, one of her Sunday school teachers at her church. And she went to visit, and the church was just full. It had been growing, just busting out the seams with new families and young people. And she saw this, this older woman, her Sunday school teacher, and they were talking about all the changes going on at church and all the new people coming in. And Cece said to her, it must, be, it must be a challenge for you getting to know all these new people. And wistfully, the, she responded, no, it's not getting to know the new people. It's that they don't know me. They don't know me. So we don't always welcome a lot of growth, the new people coming in, because they don't do things the way we've done them. We don't, it might be uncomfortable, and they don't know me. They don't know what I've offered or how I've sacrificed or helped to carry this church. They don't know my 30 years of teaching Sunday school. They don't know what I've given for, for this church. 
And so they don't respect what I've given for this church. They don't know me. There's lots of reasons we might resist rebuilding and renewing the city of God. And Nehemiah shows us that sometimes you have to respect people's position of authority and responsibility within the city of God, within the church, at the same time you do sort of an end run around them. You have to love them for what they've done and what their position is, but you have to push forward with the, with the renewal and the rebuilding that God has called you to do. Second, Nehemiah does his research. You know, so far he's really only been told, oh, by the way, the, the gates are in, and the walls are in really, really bad repair. That's all he knows. He hadn't actually seen it before this. So just like when he was praying for that opportunity to speak to King Xerxes, Nehemiah doesn't just charge ahead, he takes his time. He does his groundwork. He's thorough. He's there. He's there for three days, gets to know people, meet people, you know, shake hands, kiss babies. But he doesn't tell anyone about his plans. He waits three days for that initial curiosity to die down. He looks around. He's making mental notes, no speeches. And then he goes out and he actually surveys the walls by night, by night. Makes the rounds, sees what he can close up, and where he can't be close up, he backs up a little bit to see, sort of, get an overview of the rest of it, get a little bit of a distance. He does his research. Can it really be done? How big is the job? How could the work be organized? He knows there's going to be questions, and he wants a few concrete answers before he promotes his vision. Now, third of all, Nehemiah does not try to do it all himself. I think it's important that he did not talk about his plans first. Hey, guys, let me tell you this. I just got in from Persia yesterday, and I want to tell you what I'm planning to do. Actually, what I'm planning for you to do. If you ever get a pastor coming in and he's going to tell you all about what he's going to be getting you to do, don't vote for him, okay? Nehemiah is quiet. He listens to hear what other people are saying. He's measuring the will and the goals of the people who live there. Do you, do you realize what he's doing? He's surveying the people before he surveys the walls. He surveys the will and hearts of the people before he surveys the work. Because real change has to spring from a vision shared by the whole people. Real renewal, rebuilding, mission life never flows from the top down. It always comes, bubbles from the bottom up. That more, the more a shared vision is shaped around the hopes and the dreams and, uh, of, of the people that are there in a church, or in a community for that matter, the more people are going to catch that vision. 
And the more people catch the vision and get involved, the more successful and effective it will be. It seems to us obvious, and yet this has been a consistent problem here at KPC, not just KPC if it's any comfort. I've known lots of churches where this has been a serious problem. You see, the congregation and the session and, and the various official and unofficial leaders of the church uh, want vision and direction. They're looking for vision. They're hungry for vision. And so you, they go out and look and call a pastor who already has a vision. Whether it's your vision or not. However, if that pastor's vision does not fit with your vision, grantedly unspoken vision, nothing is going to come of it. It just isn't going to work. There'll be lots of plans and promises, but little fulfillment. You need to look for a leader who shares your vision already, who brings the energy and the resources you need to accomplish what God is calling you to do. I went to one church recently. They talked a lot about how they wanted to reach out into the community and grow. And so when I started coming up with some programs that would allow them to reach out into the community and grow, they didn't want to do any of that. I, was, I thought you wanted to reach out in the community and grow. Oh, no, no. We meant, you know, get our children and grandchildren coming back to church getting our cousins and other parts of our family coming back to church. That's what we wanted you to do. I'm sorry, the church is not a family country club. You know, if you want to do God's work, you're going to attract the people God wants here who might or might not be kin to you. And even if they are kin, they might be the ones you'd rather not be sitting next to in church. <laughs> just, just the facts. <clears throat> you got to look for a leader who shares the vision you have. And there's a lot of vision here. And I hope as we go along we'll be able to clarify some of that. But find someone who shares that vision. And on his part, a good pastor will do his research first. Listen to you, listen to the people, survey the broken walls, and will fit or adapt his vision to dovetail with the shared vision of the church members. And then you can move forward together with something you can all embrace and share and really get behind and pour your lives into together. Now, when Nehemiah does go public, <clears throat> he points out the obvious problem. And he offers a simple solution. And he challenges everybody to join together to fix it. Let's us do this. He does not say, hey guys, watch me do this. Nor does he say, hey guys, we can hire somebody to do this. He includes the people in his vision. Come on guys, we can do this. Let us rebuild. The work of the church, if it's going to be a healthy church, has to be carried by the people of the church, by the members of the church. If you have ever, and this is again 
a problem that KPC and many large churches have had where they hire people to do all these ministries. And then they wonder why people come and maybe share or participate, but they come as spectators. And they don't develop a strong emotional bond into the church. They're not really knit into the body of Christ there. They're coming for the programs that are being done by hired staff. Do you see the difference if a church is actively involved with the people carrying the work and the life of the church so that as they're involved, they develop close relationships with other members of the church until it becomes just a, a network. And you have to have all these these different strands all tied together into a network if you're going to catch any fish. Excuse me, I just changed the metaphor there. I don't know about that pastor. He was talking about building things and rocks and, and all, and then he started talking about tying strings together and throwing it into the water, and I don't know. Sounds like a mafia hit job for me, but okay. No, we've got to be knit together. And we do it in working together. Fourth, <clears throat> Nehemiah reminds them <clears throat> of their own faith values and of the power of God. He tells them, what happened to him? His own story of despair and of, of prayer and, and of faith and trusting God to open doors in unlikely ways to make things possible. Now, one of the interesting things in when he's talking with the people in town, he does not analyze the safety that a wall offers. He does not terrify the people with pictures of barbarian invaders coming for their unprotected children. All these horrible things. Instead, he talks about grace and disgrace. About faith, pride, self-esteem, and hope. And he talks about the plans and purposes of God. Because ultimately, it's about the people of God being the people of God and the God whose people they are. It's not about intellectual analytics or emotional intimidation. This is vision casting, finding and embracing the call and the destiny of God for the whole church. You see, trouble is not a good motivator. Stewardship committees would do well to take note of this. You know, we always have those, in churches, we always have those cases where somebody from the church session, or maybe it's the treasurer, or it's someone from the stewardship committee, getting up and painting dire pictures of how, you know, we're going to run out of money next week for the heating bill unless you commit and give more money. You know what I'm talking about? I don't know how many of you have ever heard those talks, but <coughs> pastors, the pastor's check will bounce. I've heard that one too. Pastor's check will bounce unless we give more. But what, it, what they're doing is using trouble to motivate stewardship, using trouble to motivate people. And people will give once to a stewardship campaign to ward off bankruptcy or whatever. They'll give once. But they will give a whole lot more 
again and again if their church is actively reaching and changing lives. Fear is not a good motivator. People who know and love the Lord really want to work in partnership with God. And if they know God is in it, they will work and support it sacrificially because they know the hand of God is in it. And if God's in it, they want to be in, with it, in it too. It's about living and worshiping a God you really believe in, in a place you uh, can personally feel proud of. It's about going to a church you really want to invite friends to. You know? It's about personally taking ownership of your community, your ministry, your mission. Fifth, fifth thing we learn, some people catch the vision and some don't. Nehemiah, Nehemiah's faith is contagious and, and he inspires some of them who cry out, well, let's just start building. Let's go. What are we waiting for? You can tell that they've just been waiting for someone to say the word, someone who's ready to lead them where they've been wanting to go all along. But not everybody gets excited. Others, we read about here, poke fun at this ambitious bodyguard and his naive bunch of yokels. They insinuate he might even be plotting rebellion. No, you know, that Nehemiah, he just wants to make himself important. So in every church, you're going to find some who can envision a healthy, growing church, and then there are going to be others who only whine and grumble. It's okay. It's biblical. In his book, I Refuse to Lead a Dying Church, Reverend Paul Nixon talks about the bright eyes, the bright eyes. Every pastor knows as you preach, you look out, you're going to see some people with bright, understanding eyes and others who just sit there dull and flat and lifeless. Of course, now when I say that, I see there are some I see suddenly kind of sit up a little straighter and stare at me a little bit more directly. But I'm just saying it is true. It happens. He, he's absolutely right. You look, there's some, it's like they, they, there's some brightness. They get it. They're with you. And then others that are, let's see, what am I going to have for lunch? I think I want chicken today. Mm, I think I've still got some green beans. You know what I'm saying. And Nixon, Paul Nixon's rule is this, preach to the bright eyes. If you're in a committee, some of your people are going to be bright eyes and some of them are just going to be there. Speak to the bright eyes. Work with the bright eyes. Because you see... It's the bright eyes who are actually going to jump in to do the work. Don't worry about the naysayers. It's the bright eyes who will shape the church of tomorrow. Just pray that all your people will become bright eyes. Six. Nehemiah focuses on the God who can, not the people who won't. The God who can and not the people who won't. He declares, the God of heaven is the one who will give us success, and we, his servants, are going to start rebuilding. This is an act of God. 
Yes, it was grounded in one man's prayer and fasting. Yes, one man forged a plan. Yes, one man outmaneuvered reluctant or even resistant church leaders. But one man alone could never make this happen. Behind this one man, there had to be one God. One God with one people can do anything. So the city of God, ever since the cross, the dwelling place of God among his people is the church. It's here. When the prophet John sees the city of God descending from heaven, it is a symbol for the church. You, do you get it? When the church is what the God is, expects the church to be, we are sitting in the suburbs of heaven. Okay, we're in the burbs, the heavenly burbs. Every congregation is just one more outpo outpost of the heavenly city of God. Now, some of us have experienced damage, even destruction and tragedy. Some of you individually have. This church has, okay? <clears throat> the walls are broken, the gates burn. Well, the walls, that represents security, stability, spiritual protection, where spiritual predators are held at bay, where pirates and thieves are repelled. So the sheep can know they're safe. It's to provide a safe place. And the gates, that means you know who's in, who's out, who are your friends, who your brothers and sisters are. You know who you can count on. They belong here with us, and we belong with them. As long as we don't draw that circle too tightly and too closely. It has to be open and porous. Here there's governance and good order. There's peace and that friendly bustle of activity and lively ministry. A thriving church provides a certain confidence and pride, the good kind of pride, in what God is doing in this place. It's the kind of church you can feel good about inviting people to. That's where God wants us to be. The city of God needs rebuilding. The church needs renewal. That there's been an earthquake. It was not covered by any earthly insurance policy, but hallelujah, we have a heavenly insurance policy. And God is going to restore the damage. That means change, however. Most of us resist change, especially if we feel it's being forced on us. But real change can't be imposed from the top down. Top down change only causes anxiety and resistance and resentment. And you've seen that before. Some of you have been through that. Necessary changes have to be recognized by everybody, <clears throat> embraced, implemented from the bottom up. You have to catch the vision. When we know that God is leading the way, then the motivation will be there and lasting change will happen. This church, too, needs to recapture its vision in order to remain a meaningful and viable presence in this community. We know that. God wants to take away your disgrace, the depression that makes us sluggish, the lack of direction that makes us unproductive, ill repute in the community, 
that's embarrassing and not always true. God wants to instill within you a new transforming vision that can energize and excite you, you and everyone who enters these doors. Something you can just throw yourself into, something you can devote your life to. Earthquake, fire, storm wind, stars falling from heaven, ah, that's nothing. Get ready for a real act of God. Let's pray. Lord, send your Holy Spirit with power. Send your holy awe and wonder across this church. Grant us the vision of what you want it to become. It'll connect with what it was before, but it'll open whole new vistas for what you want it to be next. Send your vision until it touches and inspires and motivates every person, every soul in this building. Until we will not rest, until we see it with your help fulfilled that no one, no one will want to be left out. It's going to be a different kind of church with a different spirit, but with a sense of the presence of God like people just don't feel anywhere else. And it's all up to you, Lord. Have your way with us. We say yes to you, to do with us what you want to do in the name of Christ for the life of the world. And we ask it in the name of Jesus. If you agree with this prayer, will you say amen with me? Will you stand and worship with us? In the crushing, in the pressing, you are making new wine. In the soil I now surrender you are breaking new ground sing it again in the crushing in the crushing in the pressing you are making new eye in the soil I now surrender, you are breaking new ground. So I yield you to your careful hands. When I trust you, I don't need to understand. Jesus, bring new wine out of me. In the pricing, you are making new wine. And in the soil, I, I now surrender. You are 
Remember what happened on Pentecost as the Spirit fell and 120 people, men and women, started making utter fools of themselves in public and everyone said, ah, they're just filled with... Pray this week that He wants you and this congregation to be. Where are we going next? What does he want us to become? How's that going to look? Pray for a vision. And I think in the next few weeks, we'll start seeing that sort of bubbling out here and there. If not in the sermon, then maybe in prophetic words or visions that people start sharing. I'm serious. I think we're going to start seeing some visions of what God wants to do here. And as you do, may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, it doesn't make sense at all. Keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and love of God the Father and of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, 